Today's presentation will be given by Jeff Snyder Renke, professor of Chinese history at the College of Idaho. He earned his PhD in modern Chinese history from the University of Michigan in 2006. He conducted dissertation research at the Institute for Qing History in Beijing while on a Fulbright Fellowship. Out of this research came his first book, Dry Spells, Sta State Rainmaking and Local Governance in Late Imperial China, which was published by the Harvard University Asia Center in 2009. And he's currently working on a book-length study of infant burial in the Qing Dynasty. And remarkably, in what little spare time he has, he serves as the CEO of a company that manufactures fruit tea. Which, which is true. And I actually have tea, and I forgot to which put it out. We should out. be serving it today. I know. I do have it. I actually have it in my bag. I should bring it out. Ina. We, okay, so yeah. apparently we will be serving his free yeah, tea. Yeah, well, no, you can take it with you. Nobody has. Actually, maybe I don't have it. I take that back, Ina. Um, oh, yeah, I do. I do. Yeah. Uh, in addition to drinking his tea today, um, yeah, exactly. Jeff will be speaking on spatializing infant burial in Qing China. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. I think maybe we don't even have to, maybe I don't have to give a talk. Maybe we can just sit around and drink tea. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Professor Gallagher, for that warm introduction. It's always uh, good to be back in Ann Arbor, where I can see so many um, familiar faces. Um, today's talk will be devoted to discussing infant burial in the Qing Dynasty. Uh, the paper I've prepared for you will address three issues. First, I'm going to talk about uh, infant exposure, uh, the practice of exposing infant corpses after death, and I will try to explain how and why this happened. Second, I will talk about official efforts to eradicate this practice and simultaneously to encourage people to bury their dead children. And third, I will talk about how so-called baby towers fit into this uh, larger history. Along the way, I'll also be discussing how digital technologies allow us to plot the movement of infant burial efforts over time and help us to interpret what might be going on. In fact, what much of what I'm doing here um, would not be possible uh, without large databases such as the Zhongguofang Zhe Ku, uh, as well as the diligent efforts uh, of Dagmar Schaefer's team at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin who've done a great job of meta-tagging digitized versions of local gazetteers with temporal and geospatial data, which can then be mapped and visualized. Um, they were also very generous in providing research support for me on a trip to Berlin a couple of years ago. Uh, some of the material I'm presenting today uh, will appear very soon in a Stanford University Press digital publishing project alongside work by uh, Tom Mullaney um, and Christian Henriot. I was hoping that the platform uh, would be ready for public viewing by now, but alas, the project has fallen behind schedule. Um, it'll probably be done within a month or so. Um, so I will give you a glimpse of the platform, might even toggle between some of the slides I have when I get to that part of the talk, um, but I, I will be using kind of boring static images um, for my arguments. My apologies ahead of time for that. Um, I think that's what happens when you book talk six months before they actually happen. Uh, anyway, I'd like to start with a story. In 1858, the peripatetic author Bayard Taylor made a visit to Shanghai, accompanied by two American missionaries. After passing by a large cemetery, Taylor described the following scene. Quote, between the graves and the city wall stands a low building in a clump of cedar trees. This is one of the baby towers, of which there are several near the city. All infants who die under the age of one year are not honored with burial, but done up in a package with matting and cords and thrown into the tower, or rather well, as it is sunk some distance below the earth. The top, which rises about 10 feet above the ground, is roofed, but an aperture is left for casting in the bodies. Looking into it, we see that the tower is filled nearly to the roof with bundles of matting, from which exhales a pestilent effluvium." End quote. Taylor's description of these depositories is one of the first accounts of what would eventually become a rather voluminous literature representing Chinese baby towers to an interested Western readership. For nearly a century afterward, observers of China frequently felt compelled to proffer their remarks on the burial practices of small children. One of the most vexing questions about these structures for Western audiences was, did baby towers receive the bodies of dead children or living ones? Scores of articles from the period suggested that whenever the body of a child was deposited into the tower, uh, quote, the parents are not always particular to ascertain if it is quite dead or not, end quote. Other writers were far less circumspect, stating quite plainly that the baby towel was a frightful, frightful murder house, and children were thrown alive into this ghastly receptacle and left to die at their leisure on the heaps of putrid bodies below. <laughs> 
Although their original purpose was never entirely lost, for most readers, baby towers were less about burying infants than they were about killing them. Due to their link with infanticide, baby towers would forever be connected in many people's minds with reproduction and its control rather than with Chinese burial customs. In fact, when I began this project years ago, it wasn't even clear if these structures were real. Many people thought they were essentially fictitious accounts that were fabricated by orientalizing foreigners. One of my goals then was to figure out what these stru structures were and how they related to infant burial practices more broadly. Historically, infants in China, uh, by the way, I'm going to say something about the word infant. Infant, ingar, in, in Chinese is actually has a couple of different meanings. Um, in medical texts, it typically refers to the period of time between birth and 19 months. Um, it can also be used in a more expansive sense to basically include anything between birth and, say, seven or, seven or eight sway um, for, for children. And when I use ingar, I'm using it in this more expansive uh, sense, which is the way that my uh, sources use it as well. Um, so historically, infants in China did not receive burial honors. Classical texts, such as the Ili, outline mourning practices for those who died in early death, or Shang. Um, an early death was defined as any death that took place between the ages of eight sway and 19 sway, as long as the deceased had not gone through the capping or pinning ceremonies and was not yet betrothed. The original text of the Ili divides premature deaths into three different categories. Uh, Zhangshang, or upper early deaths, for those who die between the ages of 16 and 19. Zhongshang, or middle early deaths, for those who perish between the ages of 12 and 15. And Xiaoshang, or lower early deaths, for those who die between the ages of 8 and 11. For each gradation of premature death, different mourning clothes were prescribed. The status of children who died before reaching the age of 8 sui was then ambiguous. Zheng Xuan, the, the Han Dynasty scholar who wrote one of the earliest and most influential commentaries on the Ili, <laughs> specified that tho those who died before the age of eight had no mourning clothes worn for them and were only wailed for. Zheng wrote that one day of wailing was permitted for each month the child had been alive. In other words, a child who had lived for 26 months could receive 26 days of wailing. However, a subsequent commentary on the Ili by Zhu Xi further explain, quote, three months after a child is born, the father names it. So if the child dies after then, it can be wailed for. However, if it does not ha yet have a name, then there should be no wailing, end quote. These provisions also found their way into Jushi's Jali, or Householder Family Rituals, which served as the most important text for specifying mourning practices during the later imperial period. Uh, despite these specifications for mourning, Classical texts provided parents with little guidance about how to dispose of the bodies of children who died before the age of eight sway. Indeed, families appeared to have had little direction in this regard, save for the pull of local custom. As a result, mortuary customs for children differed considerably depending on a family's native place and its socioeconomic status. In general, most young children seemed to have been buried with minimal effort, if at all. As Suna Khan has written, quote, when infants died, the bodies could be buried perfunctorily in shallow graves or simply abandoned. The older the child, the more elaborate the ceremony. Within private graveyards, certain less desirable area, areas were apparently reserved for infants and children, end quote. Perfunctory burial or abandon appears to have been, abandonment appears to have been nearly universal during the Qing. Um, about the burial of children in the region around Xiamen during the late Qing, J.J.M. Uh, de Hroat characterized the burial of children as a systematic throwing away. He lamented, quote, countless are the babies that closed in urns or wooden boxes or abandoned in the open country, uh, and so given a prey to ravens, dogs, and swine, or to quick dissolution under the operation of weather and vermin, end quote. De Hroat's observations are corroborated in Chinese language sources and suggest that burial practices in, Qing, in the Qing conform to broader patterns of infant burial worldwide. Now, what's interesting about perfunctory burial or abandonment, what I will call corpse exposure, is that there's evidence that this is one of the preferred ways to dispose of infant corpses in Qing China, at least among the poorer classes. Um, yet this was not, as De Hroat suggested, a throwing away. As you read through the sources, it's clear that rather than being evidence of neglect, exposing corpses was an intentional strategy adopted by common people, especially in northern China. For instance, the local gazetteer in Fanyang County, Shanxi, stated that infants were not buried because they were thought to damage the feng shui of ancestral tombs. The official uh, Ji Shilin, on the other hand, um, traces the practice of exposing infant corpses in Gaoping, Shanxi, to two taboos that were apparently deeply entrenched in the area. One stipulated that burying an infant would make a couple infertile. 
The other taboo stated that it was profane. Quote, there is another taboo that says bearing infants is butang. Butang is a local expression. It means that one has offended the gods and spirits, end quote. People ostensibly exposed infants in order to minimize the negative influences that flowed to the household. Indeed, many reports about infant exposure emphasize the deeply held belief that exposing infants would convey benefits to either the dead child or its family. During the Yongzheng reign, the department head of Shuozhou Shanxi, um, an individual named Wang Sisheng, suggested that people in his jurisdiction expose corpses because they believe that dead infants, if left unburied, went straight to paradise. Quote, the local people's idiotic reasoning is that they think upon death, the infant goes immediately to heaven while avoiding a descent into the underworld. I do not know who fabricated this theory or when it began, but generations have tried to eliminate it without success because the delusion is so deep, end quote. Many of their concerns rep reportedly revolved around reincarnation. People were either concerned that uh, their dead offspring would not be reincarnated or reincarnated in an undesirable location, specifically back to the family whence they came. For example, according to the local customs section of the Yongping Prefectural Gazetteer, parents did not fear the loss of a child as much as they did the prospect that it might linger after death. Quote, parents do not place the bodies of their dead children in coffins, but rather discard and expose their corpses. They're so worried that the children will be reincarnated back to the mother's womb that in their excessive sorrow, they become more merciless than even jackals and tigers. The late prefect, Zhang Chaozong, uh, issued a, in 1707, issued a notice prohibiting this custom in order to reduce its prevalence. Those who have the responsibility of protecting newborns should follow suit in order to eradicate the custom permanently. This is the meaning of showing kindness to the dead, end quote. As this passage suggests, the reason that infant corpses were exposed was precisely so they would not remain in the family. Exposure was a method that ensured that once a child died, the family would be rid of it forever. What parents seemed to fear most was the return or coming back of a dead child. So in Chinese, fu lai or zai lai. The reason for this were twofold. On the one hand, dead children who came back were thought to be short-lived, bringing back with them whatever ailment had led to their deaths in the first place, which imperiled a family's fertility. On the other hand, the return, uh, the return child would pose a threat to the family if it sought to harm them in some way. The same official in Zhao Chang Shan, she mentioned above, wrote about these anxieties. Quote, one time when I was out riding alone outside the East Gate, I went into a walled village and saw an old mother clutching a cloth bag. In a panic, she ran out of a small grove of trees. I grilled her about what she was doing, but she didn't respond. My squire told me that this was a dead child which she intended to discard in a ditch. I despondently said, uh, the children die and they're thrown into ditches? Apparently, Shanxi has a custom where children under the age of six and seven sway, no matter how they fall ill and die, are all abandoned because the parents are afraid that they will immediately come back, fu lai. Now, it's not evident in this particular account what it was meant by the term coming back, but this was a phrase that was used in one form or another in multiple sources from northern China. From these texts, it becomes clear that coming back referred to visitations of one kind or another, where the dead infant uh, returned to the household to cause the death of a subsequent child or to exact revenge on the family. Uh, the local customs section of the Uyang County uh, Henan Gazetteer explained the phenomenon in the following way. Quote, when you, children die young, uh, it's appropriate to bury them and return their bodies to the soil. This is the desire of parents. Yet there's a category of stupid person who uh, gives birth to a boy or a girl, and when it gets sick and dies, they call it a life-stealing demon, Toshengui. They take its corpse and cruelly discard it on the outskirts of town to fill the bellies of wolves and dogs. It's said that by doing this, they can prevent the child from coming back, Zailai, in another pregnancy. Moreover, when a firstborn son or daughter falls ill and dies, they must be discarded and not buried. It's said that by doing so, later births will enjoy a long life. To harbor these kinds of intentions truly is barbaric." End quote. The phrase, life-stealing demon, appears to be a local expression in Henan province for the, uh, for the returned infant. Uh, the gazetteer from Iyang County, Henan, states, quote, according to custom, all boys and girls who die between the ages of birth and six or seven sway are called life-stealing demons, Toshengui, and there is a fear that once they have died, they will come back, Fu Lai. So they are bundled in reed mats, laid in a ditch for the birds, jackals, and dogs to cruelly eat, end quote. A similar phenomenon is expressed in a slightly different way in Shanxi sources, which report that dead infants were feared to be evil spawn, uh, whose powers could be neutralized through exposure. 
Now, according to these descriptions, wild animals played a crucial role in eliminating the possibility that a child might return. The sources do not say precisely how or why this happened, but it may have had something to do with the dismemberment and consumption that naturally accompanied exposure. As I explained in the introduction, or <laughs> I was going to give you an introduction about where this project came from, but I didn't. Um, anyway, there, uh, Wang Qingren, um, who is a Qing Dynasty physician, was traveling through um, uh, the province of Zhili um, around Luanzhou um, during an epidemic that he says killed eight or nine out of every 10 children. Uh, Wang wrote, quote, poor families mostly use substitution maps to wrap and bury the dead. Substitution map mats are mats that replace coffins. It was the local custom to bury shallowly with the intention that dogs would eat the bodies. This would have the benefit of ensuring the next child did not die. Because of this, every day in each charitable graveyard, there were over 100 children with torn abdomens exposing their viscera, end quote. According to Wang's testimony, consumption by animals played a key role in preventing children from returning to the family. The likely explanation is that consumption destroyed the somatic integrity of the corpse, which prevented successful reincarnation, although there is some controversy here, as you'll see in a second. Um, in, po in the popular religious imagination, the dead body uh, could not enter purgatory and go through the process of paying off its karmic debt that would allow its rebirth if its body were in pieces. Um, thus, the disarticulated infant corpse was stranded in an existential no man's land. Parents could also mutilate an infant, uh, infant's corpse to thwart its return. Um, we read something to this effect in the writings of Ji Shilin, um, discussed earlier, where he says that some parents who had suffered through the deaths of multiple children would mut mutilate their children before laying them out. Ji wrote, quote, because their boys and girls do not survive, we see some people who repeatedly have births and deaths. Um, they cut off the child's ear or sever a finger because they believe that if they do, this child will not come back again, zalai, um, but will be reincarnated and the next birth will live. So again, kind of this assumption that they will be reincarnated or not reincarnated, um, different explanations for this. Uh, Henrietta Harrison has written that the corpses of infants in southern Shanxi were mutilated or marked with soot and ink so they could be identified by parents if they were um, ever to return later. A more likely explanation is that mutilation served an exorcistic purpose as the malignant spirit was violently expelled from the household. Uh, Donald Harper has detailed similarly violent practices in early China to dispel evil newborn spirits, and we have evidence that such practices persisted into the late 20th century in Taiwan, uh, Mark Moskowitz's book, um, The Haunting Fetus, if you're aware of it. Needless to say, there was a difference of opinion as to whether or how dead babies should be buried. Many elites, such as those who compiled or contributed to local gazetteers, favored some form of interment for infant corpses. Other people, likely at the opposite end of the socioeconomic spectrum, appeared to have favored either shallow burial or no burial at all. Not surprisingly, officials used their position in society to lobby strenuously to persuade people to bury their young. They did this not only by writing proclamations and essays of the type discussed above, but also by providing spaces for child corpses to be placed. Many of the officials discussed earlier promoted concrete measures to assist in the burial of the young. Two of the authors discussed, discussed earlier, uh, Wang Sisheng and Ji Shilin, um, encouraged elites to take concrete measures to assist in the burial of children. The biggest obstacle, they argued, was that people could not be expected to bury their young if they had no money for coffins or land for grave sites. As a result, their jurisdiction set aside land and provided coffins expressly for this purpose. That Qing officials were engaged in this kind of behavior comes as no surprise. From very early in Chinese history, officials and elites were encouraged to care for the public dead, and doing so enabled them to enact long-standing models of good governance, earn merit, uh, and assert and justify their status in local society. For example, the Li Ji states that in the first month of spring, uh, skeletons should be covered up and bones with the flesh attached to them buried. Later generations of officials understood the collection and interment of exposed bones as one of the key functions of government, upon which seasonal weather depended, and failure to do so uh, was seen as a lapse of administration and one of the primary causes of drought. What was new, or at least newer, was the increasing attention that burying children received, as well as the particular forms that this burial took. As early as the late 17th century, officials may have begun initiating infant burial efforts. For example, in 1689, Magistrate Hua Bin in Hui County, Zhili, um, prohibited the exposure of infants and may have established a charitable graveyard for children, although this last point is unclear. 
Similar efforts were undertaken by an official named Wang Tiyuan, um, who around 1700 penned an essay entitled Advocating the Burial of Infants, which discussed the problem of infant exposure in his native place of uh, Puchang, uh, Shanxi. Um, the essay was reportedly inscribed into a stone stele, uh, but the text has since been lost. The earliest organized campaign to collect and bury infant corpses that I can find appears in 1706, or Kangxi 45. In this year, Fan Guangxi, the magistrate of Linyo County, Shanxi, submitted a memorial to his superiors, asking them to issue proclamations prohibiting the Shanxi custom of exposing and abandoning infant corpses. Fan was moved by the same concerns mentioned above, exposure to the elements, qualms about corpses being eaten by animals, and so forth. In the end, Fan was able to persuade a host of other officials in Shanxi to issue orders prohibiting corpse abandonment and ordering the burial of dead children in their jurisdictions, including the governor general of Chuanshan, uh, Bo Ji, um, the Shanxi governor, E Hai, and the lieutenant governor, E Luo, um, and the grain and salt intendant, Fu Zhe Yuan. Prior to this episode, child corpses simply did not receive as much attention in local histories. As we move through the 18th century, other officials, especially in the northern provinces of Shanxi, Shanxi, Zhili, and Shandong, initiated their own campaigns to bury dead children. We've already heard about the efforts of uh, Zhang Chaotong in Yongping Prefecture in 1707, but we also see burial campaigns in Fenyang County, Shanxi in 1710, Shuozhou and Shuoping in 1730. This doesn't mean, of course, that infant corpses were not gathered during earlier periods as part of long-standing bone collecting efforts, but I can find no evidence that infants were singled out as a special category of corpse in need of extraordinary protections prior to the turn of the 18th century. Uh, a trend like this is admittedly difficult to quantify. Because we have more extant gazetteers from later periods, we naturally will find more references to infant burial the later we look. Thus, any conclusions about this pattern should be approached with due caution. However, the evolution appears to be unmistakable. The consideration paid to child corpses can be seen in the subsequent push in the mid-18th century by Qing officials to establish charitable graveyards that were dedicated explicitly to the interment of infants. Donating burial land for the poor had long been a cornerstone of elite philanthropy, um, but efforts to establish separate burial grounds for children appears to have been rare prior to the late Kangxi reign. The Shanxi officials discussed earlier, Wang Sisheng and Ji Shilin, all supported the creation of dedicated spaces for burying the young. Similar measures took place elsewhere in Shanxi. Wang Chang, for example, served as the magistrate of Xiaoyi County, uh, Shanxi, during the mid-1740s, where he was moved by the bodies of dead children that were abandoned along the county's roads. To combat this practice, he ordered that bricks be used to create cavities in the outer walls of the city on both the north and south sides. He then ordered that dead infants be placed in them, and he strictly forbade the discarding of infant corpses. Similar, um, Zhang Sijiong uh, served as magistrate of Ningwu County in Shanxi in the mid-1760s, where he attacked the custom of not burying the dead. He purchased a plot of land to erect a white bone tower, a baiguta, um, which exposed, uh, in which exposed corpses of adults could be stored. He also purchased land to bury the prematurely dead, which was known locally as the infant cemetery. Organized efforts to bury infants seem to have become fairly common by the late Qianlong period, at least in the northern provinces of Shanxi and Shanxi, and by the beginning of the 19th century, they appear elsewhere, especially in the lower Yangtze region. It was common enough in the north by the 1820s that Cui Xu, who'd uh, recently been appointed magistrate of Pu County, Shanxi, could write about his own desire to establish a burial ground for children. Quote, I've heard that all the other counties have an infant cemetery. One name for them is the Building for Depositing Children, or Ji Zi Lo, to collect and store the corpses of infants, which have been erected through the good work of sincere and benevolent gentlemen. My jurisdiction is the only one without such a building. I have long waited to construct one, but have not had the ability. By the early 19th century, similar sentiments uh, begin to appear frequently in local histories. Dedicated infant burial spaces later multiplied along with the proliferation of benevolent societies in the 19th century. The origins and evolution of the infant burial movement can be visualized um, as well. I'm gonna put a couple things up here. I'm just gonna introduce sort of what I'm working with here. So basic information about what I'm doing in terms of uh, where this information is coming from. Um, the, the work that I'm doing here and I'm presenting part of today basically works off the first 4,000 gazetteers in the Zhongwu Fangzhi Ku, which is about half of the extant gazetteers that we have in the pre-1949 period. 
Um, what uh, the, the scholars at Max Planck Institute for the History of Science have done is they have, again, tagged all of um, the, the first 2,000 of these gazetteers um, and uh, with, with data that can then be fed, uh, basically used to create um, CSV um, tables, which can then be loaded into uh, software that they have only there at MPI, um, so you can use it to visualize different kinds of movements um, or different kinds of changes uh, uh, historically. Um, unfortunately, it's something that you can only do um, at MPI. You have to be in residence, um, so you actually have to go to Berlin. Of course, they're very um, welcoming. Um, the way that I started doing this is just searching through, uh, doing searches essentially for uh, this kind of activity. And the first thing I'm going to point out is it's very, this is kind of tricky business, right? Because there are lots of different ways to say you know, inter child and bodily remains. Um, but some of the terms that were used um, are kind of included here. Um, I had sort of different interests. One was to look for um, efforts for burying children. Um, and I also had, of course, was looking for structures, which tend to be a little bit better. So cemeteries, towers, and things like that, which seem to be better um, recorded. Um, many other terms, combinations were used through the 4,000. So I could use the 2,000 that the MPI had. <laughs> But uh, Irushong, the Irushong website where the uh, Zhongwu Foundry crew is kept, you actually have access to 4,000. So you can use about 2,000 to do the first half of the searches, and then you have to search for the other 4,000 and then kind of, uh, you know, look for mishits and add additional information. So it's kind of painstaking work. Um, but I will show you, so one of the things that we see, if we, look at, um, if we look at this map, this is actually an old map, and the platform that we have built with Stanford is really quite nice and is much more complete than I'm, uh, what I'm giving you here. Um, but this will give you some ideas to what go, uh, what's going on. So one of the things that, that we see is that this, these are all of, say, infant burial activities and uh, infant uh, cemeteries that we can find in, uh, so prior to 1796 in different gazetteers. Um, and we'll, uh, there are a, a few spots here in the Funhe um, Valley that are pretty important, actually. We see a real concentration. Um, there are a few more sites right up in here. Um, but what is remarkable about this particular, um, about, about what we see here is that um, we don't see anything, any kind of references to activities or cemeteries that I can find um, in the south. And we would expect actually to find more in the south just because of the predominance of the sources, right? We have more so sources from the Jiangnan region. So we would kind of expect to see at least some um, in the Jiangnan region, which we do not. And what we see a little bit later on is that this ends up kind of moving, right, into, into central China, into southern China. Um, we also have, um, and the, the burial activities are in the blue, and then the, um, the cemeteries are in the red. And if we add on that, something that I'll talk to here in a second, um, which is uh, baby towers, okay? So I'm gonna talk in a bit here about baby towers uh, and, and what they are, and, and one of the things I'm going to, to uh, argue is that it's actually kind of a limited, um, limited geographically, limited in scope. Um, but uh, there was something, oh, so one of the things that we also, um, kind of one of the most interesting discoveries is that when we look at, uh, especially in the north, uh, when we look at uh, the correspondence between infant burial activities and philanthropic institutions, we discover that there's really a lack of correspondence. And we can see this actually by superimposing a map that was created of Qing charitable institutions by Wang, uh, Wang Daxue and his colleagues at Fudan University. Um, and I'll show you that map right here. Maybe, there we go. So Qing charitable, what's, what's interesting about this is that we see there's a very high correspondence, especially later on here, with um, different kinds of infant burial activities and charitable institutions. Um, what's, what's kind of fascinating about infant burial, it really starts here, right, in the Huanghe and Funhe corridors. Um, and what's surprising about, about um, what we're seeing here on the map is that we don't, there doesn't seem to be as close a correspondence between infant burial activities and um, and charitable institutions, which is something that we would, I think, naturally expect. Um, a much closer, and this is actually kind of important because um, scholars like Angela Leung um, have argued that burial efforts really emerged out of elite activist movements that began in 19th century Jiangnan, mid 19th century Jiangnan. Um, and what we're seeing here would suggest that these efforts predate that by about a century and a half and actually be began with officials in the North. What's interesting, a closer correspondence emerges 
when we look at this. So this is an overlay of busy counties, Chongxian, um, that was created by William Skinner, Chongxian around 1820. These are counties that served as the empire's key administrative and uh, transportation hubs. So in this uh, case, the correspondence between infant burial and busy counties in the north is particularly striking. Um, so uh, in explaining these trends, my hypothesis is that infant burial efforts were initiated by Qing officials and then only later picked up by philanthropic elites in other parts um, of the empire. Um, so when we talk about uh, baby towers, um, the structures that eventually became known in Western writings as baby towers um, really emerged out of this, out of this context. Um, the first observation that we can make about baby towers is that there was really no such thing. Um, for no other reason than there was little agreement about what to call these structures, and few of them had names that so obviously revealed their contents. Thus, local gazetteers in the Qing include a few, a few instances of ying hai ta, or infant skeleton towers, and uh, ying er gu ta, or infant bone towers, um, that almost certainly were used as receptacles for the infant dead. Cui Xu, who was discussed earlier, uses the term ji zi lo to describe some kind of building or tower to house infant remains. And De Hrot um, also mentions the term hai er gui suo, or place of resort for infants, um, used in this context. We also have a cryptic reference to a gu hun yo ta, tower for the orphan souls of children, but the gazetteer doesn't indicate whether the tower actually held human remains or more likely uh, whether it was simply just a shrine. One of the most common names used for receptacles uh, devoted to housing infant remains was ji gu ta, um, or tower for storing up bones. In fact, the Shanghai burial tower that ref was referred to in so many writings by Westerners, including those that uh, open this talk was referred to in Chinese as a ji gu ta. Um, as with other charitable institutions or charitable graveyards discussed earlier, infant burial towers were a product of official and elite activism. The Shanghai County Gazetteer mentions the creation of ji gu ta along with other charitable activities such as building bridges, uh, establishing shrines for the worthy, providing coffins for the poor, donating medicines, and so forth. Similarly, they were built in order to protect corpses from the ravages of animals and the elements. Uh, eager philanthropists not only donated money and land to build these structures, they also contributed funds to provide for their upkeep. So in Xinfeng uh, Township in Zhejiang, local elites gave land and money to build three ji in 1805, one for men, one for women, and one for children. Several local pawn shops provided 6,000 yuan uh, each year to manage the tower, and they paid annual operating costs to conduct seasonal charity work on its behalf. There are several preliminary observations we can make about infant burial towers. First, these structures appear to have been relatively recent, historically speaking. We have two references to ji that were built in the early 18th century in Songjiang Prefecture, but there's no solid evidence that either tower was dedicated to house the corpses of children. We also have one reference to an infant burial tower in Xugou County, Shanxi, um, that dates from the Qianlong period. All of the other references I have found thus far date from the 19th century. Second, infant burial towers appear to have been quite rare. After performing uh, an exhaustive search in, in the Zhongguo Fangzhi Ku, which currently includes 4,000 gazetteers, I can find fewer than two dozen references to these structures. So on the face of it, the infant burial tower does not appear to be uh, a universal fixture of the Chinese deathscape. Third, the infant burial tower appears much more frequently in sources from the Lower Yangtze region. The overwhelming majority of references we have come from a very small region in and around Shanghai, Songjiang Prefecture in Jiangsu Province uh, and Jiaxing Prefecture in Zhejiang Province. Um, it's important to note that some of these communities had multiple ji gu ta. Um, Pinghu County in Jiaxing had six. Um, thus, if we were to rely on gazetteer data, the evidence would suggest that infant burial towers were predominantly a regional phenomenon. As to why towers might have been preferred in the Lower Yangtze region, it may have had something to do with the weather, since finding underground receptacles to contain the dead in the wet southern climate may have been more difficult than elsewhere. It may have also had something to do with the widespread practice of secondary burial in this region, which made the cleaning and storing of bones a routine practice and therefore more attractive. I suspect it actually had something to do with land prices and the desire to commemorate elite philanthropic activity. 
Towers had a smaller footprint than cemeteries, and they also provided a durable monument to the philanthropist who had commissioned them. In the impassioned uh, charitable economy of 19th century Jiangnan, standalone towers may simply have been a more desirable locus for phil philanthropically minded elites, and thus a more worthy topic of discussion for those same elites than they were in other parts of the empire. There's also one other thing I would add to this, which has to do with the mid 19th century rebellions. One of the differences that we see, I think, in the North and also in Jiangnan is that in the North, a lot of times we have officials who are basically encouraging individual burial. And if you think about what a, what a tower is, say a so-called baby tower, it is basically a kind of mass burial. So one of the things I'm kind of looking into now as I go get into the Jiangnan uh, philanthropic material is looking to see whether these were constructed largely as a response to mid-19th century rebellions, like the Taiping rebe Rebellion, where it would have been very difficult, I think, to, you know, if you think about sort of corpses scattering the land, um, to, to, it would be difficult, I think, to, um, to just logistically trace different bones and everything else, which would make a kind of mass burial um, much more, um, I think, practical. Um, Anyway, so the discussion thus far would suggest that there was a dramatic shift in attitude toward the infant corpse that took place in the late imperial period. So how do we explain this change? Uh, there are a few explanations that I find plausible. Um, the first concerns shifting official attitudes toward the physical body and anxieties about interment that we see in many writings about infant burial. Although common people in the 18th century routinely exposed their infant dead, expecting that they be consumed by wild animals, the same cannot be said for many officials. In virtually all of these texts, officials express in graphic language their horror that the body parts of children are strewn across the landscape, exposed to the elements um, to suffer the munch and crunch of wild animals. In this regard, the prospect that child remains are essentially becoming part of the local food chain suggests heightened anxieties about properly preserving and commemorating human corpses. We know from the work of Norman Kutcher that unburied corpses were a growing concern for the Qianlong court. Adult in coffin bodies that were either temporarily buried in a practice called fu tuo, um, or left for decades exposed to the elements came under fire in the 1740s by officials uh, such as Chen Hongmo, um, who considered delayed burial, especially among elite families, to be a serious problem. These anxieties may have been exacerbated by discussions surrounding cremation during the Qianlong period. So Jurchens and Manchus had traditionally practiced cremation, but this uh, began to change after the Qing Dynasty was established and bannermen were encouraged to follow the Chinese practice of interring bodies of the dead. Mark Elliott relates the story of Arigun, the garrison general at Qingzhou, who advocated cremating bodies of bannermen who died at their posts in order to facilitate the delivery of their remains back to the capital. The general reasoned uh, that cremated remains were more economical to store and transport than entire corpses, so cremating the bodies of dead bannermen would free up valuable garrison resources. Qianlong rejected this argument, stating that bodies should be buried according to ancient, i.e. Chinese, custom. Yet Elliot Marshall's evidence to suggest that cremation may have persisted well into the 19th century. It's possible that the positive reception of infant burial uh, campaign, the, the uh, positive reception to the infant burial campaign promoted by Fang Guangxi in Shanxi province in 1706, which is really the first organized campaign that I can find, was somehow tied to similar concerns with the banners, since the three highest ranking officials who issued their own orders to prohibit infant exposure and promote burial, Governor General Bo Ji, Shanxi Governor E Hai, and Lieutenant Governor E Luo were conspicuously all Manchus. Uh, in other words, by the beginning of the 18th century, the state was reiterating on several fronts it, its commitment to burial as the only orthodox means of disposing of the dead. And it would make sense that infant burial would eventually become implicated in this discussion. No doubt anxieties about the exposed body were exacerbated by the proliferation of corpses during the Qing as population growth, urbanization, and rebellions increasingly led to a surplus of unruly bodies. It's plausible that these fears contributed to a growing feeling that exposed corpses, adults and, or, or infants, were symptoms of increasing social disorder that needed to be remedied. In light of this movement toward orthodoxy, efforts to reform infant burial, particularly official campaigns against exposing infant corpses, should also be understood as part of a long-standing Confucian polemic against popular Buddhism. As the discussion earlier uh, indicated, parents very often justified exposing their infant corpses by appealing to folk understandings of fertility and uh, transmigration. 
As a result, it's possible uh, that the concern with reincarnation and much of the terminology surrounding the consumption of corpses by wild animals was inspired by folk Buddhist understandings of infant burial. As Liu Shufun has demonstrated, corpse exposure, a practice called Lu Shi Zai, um, became one method of burial in northern China during the medieval period, um, popular among um, uh, Buddhist adherents. Liu explains, quote, many Buddhists appear to have been inspired by the example of the Sakyamuni Buddha, who in one of his previous incarnations offered his body to wild animals. Dana of the dead was to be accomplished by offering one's body to living creatures through exposure in rivers and forests, end quote. Indeed, much of the imagery that Leo says uh, was employed in Buddhist monastics, by Buddhist monastics and lay people to extol the feeding of corpses to animals, replete with evocative depictions of pecking, sucking, and gnawing, sounds stri uh, strikingly familiar to the descriptions of this practice by Qing officials. The fact that officials also relied heavily on canonical Confucian texts in their campaigns to eliminate the practice suggests that infant burial had become a site where a larger ideological battle between officials and local religions was being waged. The movement toward infant burial also suggests a rise in sentimentality toward children as a whole and a corresponding sensitivity toward infant corpses in particular. Again, Virtually all the lengthy discussions we have about why infants deserve to be buried speak extensively about the natural love or care that parents feel for their children. It was precisely the peculiar character of the parent-child attachment, a cosmic bond reflected in the principles of heaven that were expressed in human relationships as well as the natural world more broadly, that militated against uh, anonymous or indecorous burial. One of the more interesting prospects in thinking about this shift is the possibility that it may have arisen out of a growing concern for young girls in late imperial China. Xiong Binzhen talks in her work about the emergence of a daughter-loving culture in the late Ming and early Qing dynasties through which elite men increasingly expressed their affection for their living daughters as well as their acute sorrow when their daughters died young. Considering that the number of exposed infant remains would almost certainly have been disproportionately female, it would make sense that a growing concern for living girls would translate into concern for dead ones. The gazetteer from Yongping Prefecture, Zhi Li, records the efforts of Wang Rei Zheng, who, in the, who, who around 1828 um, built a charitable cemetery for burying infants. Wang wrote about the customs in his hometown saying that it is common to see young girls, uh, Nu Yo, uh, abandoned in the suburban wilds where their corpses are exposed and cruelly consumed by wolves and dogs. People uh, walking on the road sit, cannot help but weep at this state of affairs and ask how parents could in the end be so malicious." End quote. Wang later talks about why proper burial for both sons and daughters is so important, um, but it was clear that the plight of girls that made the deepest impression on him. Of course, burial was not the only field within which the social value of girls was changing. During the Qing, we see a range of elite philanthropic activities, a movement I would call girlanthropy, um, in which the young female body was singled out for reformist efforts. Campaigns against infanticide, the establishment of foundling homes, campaigns against foot binding, and so forth. I hope it's now relatively clear what uh, a more complete history of the baby tower might look like. What were called baby towers were actually an historically recent addition to the late imperial deathscape that could be found primarily in the area immediately surrounding Shanghai, the place in China where the foreign presence was arguably most pronounced. In many respects, they were a peculiar product of two overlapping concerns that had roots in different regions of the empire. Campaigns to encourage infant burial that emerged in northern China in the early 19th century combined with a preference for burial towers that were built by philanthropists in the lower Yangtze region. In a pattern that followed colonial encounters elsewhere, such as debates over sati in India, many foreign visitors to China mistook what was a geographically circumscribed uh, burial practice and applied it to the empire as a whole. In the process, baby towers became a touchstone for concerns about infanticide, childhood, gender, class, and death that connected audiences in both China and at home. Their existence, of course, could also be used to justify the continued presence of benevolent foreign agents who advance their own enlightened social and political programs. One of the most delicious ironies of the baby tower phenomenon relates to what we might call the clash of civilizing missions that these structures embodied. On the one hand, we had activist Chinese elites who sought to reform what they considered to be the barbaric burial practices of the benighted masses. On the other hand, we had Western visitors who sought to reform what they considered to be the barbaric burial practices of the benighted Chinese elites. In both of these cases, the so-called baby tower 
shifted the horizon of each, creating new possibilities for action and suggesting new programs to be pursued. Perhaps it's only fitting that in the Qingpu County Gazetteer uh, from 1934, a Chinese author, no doubt one of Shanghai's emerging modern elites, would contemptuously describe the Jiguta that still stood outside that city in a way that would have resonated with many of his Western predecessors as a fetid, archaic testament to a past generation of misguided do-gooders. Thanks. Questions? I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. You seem to be talking mostly of the economy version of dealing with dead babies, right? Yeah. And so these are people who did not have resources to bring in religious specialists and so forth. Mm -hmm. So what do we know about people who had money and what they would do? Presumably, they could invest resources to get people a better incarnation, get them to heaven and so forth. Yeah. But then you also have to have like an address or an identity of the dead person. Yeah. And so, uh, for instance, uh, I can't imagine babies getting uh, shenzhu, spirit yeah. tablets, and things yeah, yeah, like yeah. that. So in other words, how did this work out with people who did have the resources that wanted to do something for the kid that was more complicated than uh, exposing them? Yeah, so one of the things that um, obviously kind of comes up here is what we call this. I mean, I, I sort of frame it because Liu Shufan talks about sort of the practice of exposing corpses in medieval Buddhism kind of frame it in that way, but there's a strong argument to be made that what we're seeing here is not actually Buddhist at all. I mean, it probably in some people's head it is, and others it isn't, because it bears a lot of similarity to, to um, the aggrieved soul, for example, in Taoism. And we do have evidence that one of the things that did happen with elite families is they would, in fact, bring in Taoist ritualists in order to sweep away the malignant uh, spirit of, of, the, of the baby. I think that one of the things that we don't one of the problems, of course, in getting at this particular issue is finding people who are going to talk about it openly. Because um, if we do have this discourse out there that this is very much frowned upon, then the question is, well, what do we, you know, whether people are going to talk about this openly? And so we do have. What's that? No, they don't get in there at all, no. So that's kind of an absence, right, that we sort of have to work around, which is part of the problem, I think, just in terms of sources um, that, we, that we have. But we do have uh, writers, uh, fiction writers, for example, who talk about this particular problem um, and uh, in, in short stories and, and will we'll indicate that it is probably happening um, quite a bit more than we might imagine. This is one of the reasons when I say that, you know, those of higher socioeconomic status and lower socioeconomic status, I tend to not buy into that too much because I think, especially with officials like Chun Homo, uh, sort of being concerned about this particular problem or burial in general, I think that um, one of the things that worried elites and officials most is when it, it was being done by um, elites. So I think there's probably a lot more of it going on than we know, I suspect. Any other questions? I'm sorry for the unappetizing. When I was a grad student, I think Ernie at one point, we, we, were, we were in a talk with, uh, I think it was Charlotte Firth, actually. And we're talking about blood. And uh, I think it was Ernie said something about blood. Not very good for a lunch, uh, for a lunch lecture. Anyway, other. Okay. This is slightly off the topic, okay. but I'm wondering about the relation of naming children in terms of the death rates that you talk about. Uh -huh. I sort of have the, in mind that it's maybe after a year it's named. Names are done? Well, or? technically, it should be after about three months, okay. right? Although I think it, I, I think it depends, actually, but I think three months is the time at which it's um, given a name. Does anybody know for sure? That's my understanding. But this is coming out of things like, like the Ely, so um, that three months is, which is kind of Jushi's point, that if it's not named, then you don't wail for it until it's named. But at, point, well, at what point it became... Okay, you know, when you sort of recording that, I'm not exactly sure because there might be two different things going on there, right? One sort of chuming, and then the other one, I don't know whether these are actually typically they're written down in, in, the, in the genealogy, but I don't know whether that's actually happening at the same time. If so, somebody knows, I'd love to hear. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, Is it on? Yeah. Any evidence of uh, baby uh, towers in the diaspora outside of uh, oh, what we think of as. Question. Is it a question you've um, asked? I, I don't or? know of any, no. 
Um, that, that might be an interesting. Yeah, that uh, would be yeah. fascinating. And, you know, it would not surprise me. I mean, obviously, if you had people who were kind of leaving China in a place where this is quite common, going to Southeast Asia, for example, <coughs> um, yeah, it, it wouldn't surprise me. But I don't know of any, no. Good question. Um, I was just wondering if you've looked at all at um, the practice of infant exposure post Qing, because um, I've heard accounts of it still being practiced yes. in the 20th century, and whether there's continuity in terms of the, the rationale behind the practice, the religious significance, or, or not. Yeah, so I think um, it is certainly happening. Um, I think that I know it's happening when you, in the 1930s, 1920s, 30s, and 40s. So if you if you read Christian Henriot's book, Scythe in the City, he talks about this, um, this issue, right, where it's very common in cities, and not surprisingly, actually, but very common in cities when children die just to abandon their bodies in the street. <clears throat> One of the problems is that city dwellers rarely had any kind of, you know, any means to actually bury the child in the city, right? So um, sometimes they were kind of thrown into scrubland, but very often they were just left on the streets. And of course, a lot of people sort of coffin uh, well, you had a different kind of burial society who would gather the uh, gather corpses up in the morning and and um, and then inter them. Um, but I think it probably extends quite late. And this is an anecdotal story that comes from um, former student of mine at Harvard, um, Max Oitman. I don't know if people know him, just uh, Tibet and the Qing. Um, but he he was. We we're talking about this project, and he says, I'm, you know, he was at LeBron Monastery um, and said that he had run across a ditch that had uh, that had fetuses, um, that babies that were corpses of babies that were in it, several of them actually. So I don't know what's going on there. I don't know if it's connected, but I'm suspecting that these things don't die overnight, right? So um, I haven't really looked in the post, uh, I, I know in the 20s and 30s it's happening, I haven't looked in like post 49 period. I would guess that we see a market decrease, but I don't really know. That's the true. account that I heard was also anecdotal, but it was during the Cultural Revolution oh, in mm -hmm. the countryside. So, yeah, 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 yeah. So that would not, I mean, I had the same experience when I, uh, you know, when I was researching rainmaking, which is, I, I went to the um, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences in Beijing, and I was asking the librarian there, you know, I'm doing this project on show you. Do you have any, do you have any, any materials or anything? And she said, no, I don't think we have anything here. But she said, this, this show you, this rainmaking thing is very fascinating. And she was telling me stories about how during the Cultural Revolution they were praying for rain in, the, in her in her hometown. So. Um, of course, I don't think, you know, it wasn't made a, a big deal wasn't made of it, but um, it, I think it probably did happen, and I don't know to what extent, though, so I'd have to say I'm not sure. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm wondering about the digital, the digital scholarship perspective mm -hmm. of your work. Yeah. So you mentioned that you basically use the Zhongguo Fang Zhi Ku, the mm -hmm. The four thousand items uh -huh. in the series one and two, uh -huh. so um, because I think um, four thousand may not be a enough, uh -huh. big enough uh, yeah, yeah, number. Yeah. I mean, compared to the whole body yeah, yeah, yeah. of the uh, material. So I was wondering, um, how how do you how do you see um, the materials that you are not able to cover, and uh, how do you see that impact your study about the correlation between the burial um, spots and mm. then the chari charity institution? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so. Yeah. No, it's yeah. a very good point. I, I have 50% of the extant gazetteers, right? That means there are 50% out there, 4,000. It could be that they all talk about, uh, you know, infant burial in Jiangnan in the 17th century. Um, there's no way of getting around that, except by looking individually through 4,000 gazetteers. One of the things that makes this so, I think it'd be very difficult to do this kind of scholarship without these larger databases because you wouldn't be able to, I mean, because you can't physically look through 8,000 gazetteers in order to find this kind of information. Um, but it is a very good point. It's one that, you know, that I, I concede, right? Um, there's nothing that, really we can do about it until we see the other 4,000 that I've heard this, the, the next batch will be coming online here pretty soon, um, at which point we'll have 6,000. Um, but no, it, I think that it's a tentative, <coughs> if we find sources that, um, that sort of indicate otherwise, it's, it's everything that this might all be completely wrong. But um, we'll have to wait to see where that happens. There's a, a second part of your question. 
So because I think you based um, upon the 4,000 uh, uh, items, mm -hmm. so because you, al you also show a map, the mm -hmm. overlay yeah. of the chari charitable, yeah. yeah, so how do you see, um, like, uh, um, uh, because you only cover 4,000, and yeah. <laughs> so um, I was just uh, wondering whether um, the parts that you don't cover yeah well I mean th this is yeah yeah so, so this is uh, the other thing that I kind of um, one of my questions for the team at Fudan University is whether when I see this blank spot right here right where a lot of this is taking place I also question you know is this have they missed something right in their um, analysis um, but because it does seem to be kind of a black hole and a pretty important part of the empire right so um, it, it also could be that their analysis is wrong, right? So I think that um, one of the things I'm kind of basing that observation on their analysis, but you know, this is kind of the way it works until you find other evidence or until um, you know, they end up revising. Um, I have looked for uh, evidence of charitable institutions, these locations, and uh, what, what they have done kind of holds up. Um, but no, it's not to say that, um, that this, you know, this is not, like most history, not the definitive word. But um, I, I would also say that 4,000 is not, you know, that we need to keep in mind that it's not a small amount, right? I mean, I'm not sure that we need, so, you know, yeah. do we need all 8,000? Yeah, I would, I would prefer that, obviously. But we also need to keep in mind that the numbers here are pretty big and that it's not inconsiderable is the way I would put it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Hi. Uh, Hi, Tom. <coughs> Uh, um, let's see. Um, I, th I, th I think you're going to just say, no, we can't know that, mm -hmm. but I'm going to ask anyway. Okay. Um, so in my uh, pre-modern Japanese historical sources, mm -hmm. there are ways a little bit to think about gender mm -hmm. in a way that is, I think, not really so possible with Chinese gazetteer material. Mm -hmm. I'm just assuming, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering um, two things. One is that... Um, the relationship between the dead babies and the family. Mm. So you talked about family in mm -hmm. most cases. Mm -hmm. Towards the end, you talked about father and daughter. Mm -hmm. But in this family, are there ways for you to see if there's any difference between the uh, relationship uh, between mother and the baby and the father and the baby? Mother being the person who gave birth to that baby mm. and maybe perhaps the attachment the sense of attachment is different from yeah. mm -hmm. the man who's mm -hmm. managing the household. Mm -hmm. So that's one. And the other is the gender of the babies. So you didn't talk about for earlier periods uh, if the babies were girls or boys, if there was any differentiation at all. Mm -hmm. I was assuming that, that there wasn't any differentiation. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, anyway, can you talk about this? Yeah, so I think when we, uh, uh, in terms of, um, I'm glad that you asked anyway. Um, I think that in terms of when we, what's possible with the sources, I think especially the, the most evidence that I have of this is uh, of what is claimed to be sort of people from a lower socioeconomic class engaging in this kind of behavior. Again, I'm a little skeptical of that, but that is certainly where the evidence is. In terms of those people, why they are exposing their, um, you know, why they're exposing their infants, well, I, we actually don't know that much about why they're doing it, right? All I know is what a, a Qing official says is the reason for why they're doing it. And I suspect there is a lot of confusion there. I mean, you can tell from the language that these officials are using, they're just almost dripping with condescension um, about, this, uh, about this practice. So, um, and of course, the people who are doing the exposing, whether they be the mothers, right? Um, we do have, it seems to me that the people who are doing most of the exposing are actually women, first of all. Um, but the evidence of that is limited, but I don't know why them instead of the men. And of course, um, I don't have any sources in terms of what you know, farmers in, in northern China in the 18th century, how they, you know, what they even think about this particular um, practice. So it's a function of the sources where um, I'm skeptical of what, uh, of what officials are saying about this practice, but again, it's the only good uh, information we have, the only reportage. But whether they are faithfully reporting what it is that 
that uh, local people are doing when they do this, I, I don't know. So I really, I would love to be able to get into that. Um, but I, I mean, I know that, you know, Fabian Drexler's um, work um, is, I, I think that he's got sort of much better sources than we have on this um, particular point. But yeah. Sorry, I can't be more helpful with that. I'm assuming that the character G in uh, Ji Gu Ta is Ji Sun. Ji, Dui Ji the Ji, stack really? up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, I kept hearing a fourth tone. No, Ji, oh. sorry. I'm sorry about that. Because I must have had that. that would uh, have a particular implication of what they thought was going to happen to the bones. Which yeah, no, no, no. Right. Ji. Sorry about that. Dui Ji the Ji. No, I'm sorry about that. I should be a better student. So if this the uh, Ji Gu Ta, so uh, if the, the tower is full and which organization or institution has cleared it? Typically Buddhist monks. Uh -huh. So um, usually they were burned, okay? So it really depended on the structure, okay? Because we have, one of the things I didn't really get into here, but it's part of the, the um, you know, it's part of the article that'll be published here online, is that there, is, there are a lot of things going on with, um, with structure. So even calling them baby towers is a little bit misleading because we have different receptacles, depositories into which these bodies are put. And sometimes they are just, um, we have descriptions and they're just kind of square brick enclosures. Um, other times they're built into the city walls, which is kind of fascinating, I think. And then other times they're standalone structures. Um, I think what's going on here in terms of um, the sort of the architectural differences is that a standalone structure of the kind that we see very often in and around Shanghai, it just, they tend to be very monumental. Many of them are very ornate, elaborate. Um, and this is one of the reasons of the talk I talk about the, the kind of commemoration of the philanthropist becomes very important here. I think the function of those and also the money for upkeep and things like that um, is probably a bit more developed. So I read the, um, the example of the Xinfeng uh, Township um, example where they actually did provide money for people to come in and burn the remains that were in. And sometimes they would burn and scatter the ashes. Um, other places I think this, this didn't happen. Um, so it really depends on the location. But for the ones that were, that were sort of better supported, um, this, the standard practice was for Buddhist monks to come in and to conduct a, a ceremony to burn um, the contents of the, of the receptacle and then to um, sometimes scatter the ashes. So. Uh, what's happening down south? Yeah, so what's happening down south? Very, uh, uh, I don't really know. I mean, one of the things, so this is, this is fascinating. It's a great question, which is you, we would think, right, with all of, you know, these, um, with all of these references that we would have something going on down south. We do know that there are you know, places like Xiamen, for example. I mean, all the, the testimony from De Chod is really sort of southern. Um, but in terms of what's going on in places like, you know, Guangdong, uh, I have no idea. And the, the gadgeteers are kind of mute. And this is another problem, sort of getting back to the sources question, which is that one question is, is to what extent these are discussed in other kinds of sources that we really can't. Um, we, so this is one of the things that I'm sort of in the process of trying to find out, is looking at other sources to find evidence of what might be happening to, to babies that isn't. Um, included in local gazetteers. So um, things like uh, Jiapu, for example, or other kinds of um, essay um, writing. So at this point, it's a big kind of void, um, which, which of course can't be right, right? I mean, there, there, it, there must be. Um, they are clearly doing something with their um, infants. We do have uh, sometimes, there, there are interesting practices having to do with infant burials, like putting uh, putting corpses into baskets, which are then hung by hung in trees. Um, many of these practices seem to be very localized, um, but um, I think it's like a lot of other things that um, where you you do have kind of pockets of of uh, you know, different kinds of cultural behavior that that aren't necessarily shared. But it's a it's a big um, yeah absence that I can't at this point explain. Um, but clearly, you know needs to be explained eventually. And I hope to, when it's done. Okay, yes. we have time for one more question. Oh. 
Woo, I'm the last one. <laughs> uh, is there any, Make it like, good. it was interesting listening to all those explanations, but um, I'm also curious, was there any, especially if they were officials, were they, were they ever influenced by changing thoughts of um, burial practices and being, like, hygienic? Because um, I'm imagining uh, if you had, like, a local custom of hanging some bodies from trees. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I would imagine officials would have had more exposure to outside foreign ideas or something. But but then again, when you said some practices went back to the late 1700s, I don't know how how deep back like changes in hygienics yeah. you know, would have gone. So we do see a lot of that kind of discussion later on, right? So when we get into the late Qing, so the la last decade of the Qing, when we start seeing, say, you know, um, new policies end up emerging, and we see an emerging discourse about, about hygiene, right, into the 1920s and 1930s, this becomes a very important um, discussion, right? And even, we even see it in Shanghai in the 1920s and 1930s. A lot of it's coming from foreigners who say that, you know, we, we can't have bodies kind of out there in the streets because it's unhygienic. We need to, to do something with them. But in earlier periods of time, um, you, we don't see as much of that. Even people like Wang Qingren, right, who is a physician who's traveling around, um, one of the things you probably didn't pick up on, but when he describes what's going on with these uh, children, he's, he's explaining, one of the things he's explaining is why it was that he was able to view viscera, okay? So he's, he's actually talking about something different, which is he's talking about how he ends up seeing internal organs like intestines and things like this. And he's, he's kind of uh, giving the readers, well, you know, the reason I know this is because there was this pestilence and we went out. And, and the, the animals had gotten to them and exposed the viscera so he could actually look at them. So he's actually doing something very different. He's not a concern. And Wang Qingren doesn't, doesn't talk about this um, issue as being sort of unhealthy. Um, I think that that's generally a later discussion. And we do see a lot more of it in, say, late 19th century among foreigners. I mean, one of the things that happens here, um, again, it's kind of in the larger study, is that as Europeans become very concerned about hygiene. And also before hygiene, they're really concerned about things like smells. So in the first story that I read about the baby tower, you know, uh, B.R. Taylor talks about the pestilent effluvium, right? These are discussions that are going on in America and in Europe simultaneously with what's happening here in China. In fact, child abandonment is a huge problem in the United States and London at the same time that foreigners are writing about this. So for them, what they're really concerned of, there's a lot of movement then in terms of ideas, right? You have a lot of foreigners who are coming to China and with this idea about how burial should happen, we have this movement to garden cemeteries in the West, right? Um, as a way of getting away from some of the older Paris cemeteries where bodies were inter intermingled. So those ideas are coming in. Initially, it's really kind of the olfactory um, side of things. But then by the late 19th century and early 20th century, they start talking about hygiene. But um, most of the discussions I've seen that are quite localized, actually, in the area in around Shanghai. And um, they're discussions that are being had by, uh, by Europeans until we get into, say, the 20s and 30s. And Ruth Rudiaski talks about this in her book, um, Hygienic Modernity, where she discusses some of the debates over cemeteries that are very much implicated in uh, public health and, and hygiene, but they tend to be quite late in the scheme of things. Thanks, yes, <laughs> I have. If you want tea, take the tea. Thank you.